Ernest. The Dukedom Secret Series, Book 4, written by Edith Bird and published by Starfall Publications, available on our website. Chapter 1 Lancaster, England, 1818 The red one won't fit, neither will the yellow one. Every day I seem to lose another dress to my ever-expanding enormity, Lily exclaimed, tossing the dress she was holding onto her bed and collapsing onto the chaise lounge by the window with a sigh. Alicia looked at her sympathetically. Lily was heavy with child, expecting any day, and every time Alicia saw her she seemed to grow bigger. Today she was dressed in a flowing white nightgown, her shoulders wrapped in a shawl, but even this was growing too tight for her, and it would surely not be long before nothing in her wardrobe would fit. Can't your maid do something about it, Alicia said, and Lily rolled her eyes. Helen couldn't let out a dress. She can barely darn a pair of stockings, bless her. No, I'll, I'll have to send for something to wear. The modiste, perhaps she'll come and measure me. I've got nothing to wear for the tea party on Monday. Imagine that, the hostess without a thing to wear. I can hardly sit with the county ladies in my nightgown, can I? She exclaimed, sighing again, and raising her arms above her head with a look of despair on her face. The two friends were taking shab tea in Lily's private sitting room. It was a pleasant room, comfortably furnished, overlooking the parkland of Burnley Abbey, the imposing edifice of which was visible beyond the trees across the garden. Lily and Maximilian had lived in a house belonging to a great uncle of Maximilian since their marriage. It had been a gift from the Duke and Duchess, and Alicia was a frequent visitor. Her parents divided their time between London and Lancashire, and having spent several seasons there, they had purchased a house not far from Burnley Abbey, where Alicia now lived for much of the year. Oh, they won't mind. Just stay sitting down and wrap yourself in a shawl. They'll not know the difference, Alicia replied, even as Lily looked at her aghast. I'm to be the Duchess of Lancaster one day. I can hardly be seen in such a terrible state. Oh, it's hopeless. I think I'll cancel the whole thing. I'm sure it wasn't like this with Emily, but now... Oh, I just want it over with, she exclaimed. Emily was Lily and Maximilian's first child, and Alicia's goddaughter. She was a dear little thing, not quite a year old, and Alicia was always happy when Lily brought her to call on her, or invited her to walk with them in the parkland. I'm sure it won't be long. You just need to have patience, Alicia replied. Patience? Spoken by a woman who's never known what it's like to carry a child. Believe me, when you do, you'll find patience a difficulty, Lily replied, struggling to sit up and shifting herself back and forth as though trying desperately to get comfortable. Alicia could not help but smile. Marriage and motherhood had made Lily a very different person to the one Alicia had first encountered in London, when they were both in the first flush of youth. Back then, she had been hot-headed and fiercely independent, but the years had mellowed her, and now she no longer wrote scandal sheets for a living. Her interests were concentrated on more domestic matters. Well, I am sure that won't be happening for a while, Alicia replied as the Lily finally got herself into what appeared to be a comfortable position, looking up at Alicia and narrowing her eyes. And why not? You received a great deal of attention at the assembly room's ball last week. How many marks on your dance card were there? Three? Four? Lily said and Alicia blushed. She had danced with several men at the ball. But as for seeing them again... Oh, but you know what these things are like. A dance doesn't mean anything if the man doesn't pursue the matter further. If a dance isn't followed by a call the next day... It should be forgotten, she said, returning Lily's gaze sardonically and folding her arms. Lily laughed. Oh, nonsense. There were any number of eligible men there, and all of them were interested in you, she said, tutting and shaking her head. Name one. I danced with the Duke of Hamilton's third son. He talked of nothing but entering the church and becoming a bishop. I don't want to be a clergyman's wife. Then... There was the odd-looking man with the squint and crossed eyes. He was a merchant. 
I don't want to marry a merchant, and certainly not a cross-eyed one. Lancashire society just doesn't offer anything more than third sons and social climbers. They come here because in London, they're nothing, Alicia said. She liked living in Lancashire. She liked the country walks and carriage drives. She liked the fresh air and pleasant company of like-minded people. She liked to be near Lily and Emily. But as for finding a husband... And there was someone else, Lily said, raising her eyebrows. Alicia blushed. Oh, yes, well, Ernest Lord Crawshaw, I suppose. But he's not going to be interested in me, is he? Not really. He's the son of a duke, but a son with prospects. I don't even know why he was there, Alicia replied. She had danced with Ernest Howard, and they had enjoyed a pleasant conversation. But that was as far as it had gone, at least from Alicia's perspective. He was a pleasant man, handsome, with blonde hair and a chiselled face, and had spoken of his admirable work in building a school for blind children in Manchester. His father, the Duke of Crawshaw, was blind, and it seemed Ernest had found within himself a desire to do what he could for those less fortunate than himself, for he had told Alicia he felt fortunate not to have been born with his father's affliction. He was trying to garner support for the school he's building, for blind children, he told me all about it. But I think he was only being friendly. I liked him, but nothing would ever come of it. I doubt he's even in the district any longer, Alicia replied. It had been pleasant to meet Ernest and to dance with him, but she had really given little thought to anything more. A dance was a dance, and without a calling card or the promise of an invitation, it was merely a passing pleasure. But his parents live in the district. Anne knows their daughter Isabel. She was at their wedding. I think Ernest was too, though, of course, I wasn't there myself. She and Anne are good friends, though. You should speak to her about it. She'll be at the tea party. I could invite Isabel too. Lily said, her eyes brightening, as though she intended to distract herself from her pregnancy by playing matchmaker. Alicia groaned. Oh, Lily, I don't need you to do that. I'm sure it was just a passing pleasure, a dance and a conversation. I'm sure he's entirely forgotten me. I'd look a fool if you started making assignations on my behalf to Isabel. She'd think I was quite ridiculous. Besides, you forget I'm just the daughter of a merchant. I can't marry the first son of a duke, Alicia said. She did not want Lily to interfere, even as she knew her friend had only her best intentions at heart. Without her scandal sheets to write, Lily was often at a loss as to what to do with her time, and it was then she would start interfering in that of others. She liked to have her projects, and it seemed Alicia was about to be her next. Oh, nonsense! I'm the daughter of the man who single-handedly tried to bring down the entire Oakley dynasty and destroy the House of Lancaster for good. Now, I'm married to its heir. Those sorts of things don't matter. Not really. If you fall in love, be it with prince or pauper, that's all that matters, she said. It all sounded so simple when put like that, but Alicia knew better. Marriage was governed by convention. And, whilst her own father would never dream of forcing her hand, he had made it clear he expected her to make a suitable match soon. But I've not fallen in love with anyone. I've danced with one man at a ball. He happened to be pleasant and charming. I'll probably never see him again. I'm quite content with that, Alicia said, for she really did not see any point in pursuing the matter further. Lily tutted. Don't be so defeatist. We'll invite Isabel to the tea party. You can be properly introduced by Anne, and then we can discover the delightful coincidence of your having danced with Isabel's brother. She'll insist on the two of you meeting again. I can just imagine it. She'll say something like, Oh, Ernest is so busy helping others, he doesn't have time for romance. But I feel so sorry for him. He deserves the happiness of companionship. And that's when we'll suggest the two of you meet again. She'll agree, and then... Lily said, clapping her hands together in delight, as though the matter was already complete, 
and Alicia was betrothed to a man she had only met once and knew nothing of apart from his, his being the son of a blind duke. Alicia sighed. Lily was relentless when it came to such things. She had replaced her observation of the lives of others with direct interference, and Alicia knew she would not easily be dissuaded now the idea of Ernest had been planted in her mind. I'm not sure it's that simple, Lily, Alicia replied, but her friend shook her head. It's perfect, Alicia. Don't you want to see him again? Weren't you disappointed he made no further arrangements to see you? She asked. Alicia had to admit to a slight disappointment, though she was not about to appear desperate to attract the attentions of a man who clearly had far more important things to think about than the flirtations following a ball. Ernest had been, by far, the most eligible of the men she had danced with, but as for expecting him to remember her. A little, perhaps, but... I don't want you to go to any trouble, Lily, she said, even as she realised immediately it was the wrong thing to say. Oh, but it's no trouble. You're my dearest friend, and to think of all you've done for me in the past. If it weren't for you, Maximilian and I would never have married. I owe you my happiness, Alicia, and I intend to repay it by making you happy too, she said. Alicia sighed. Lily was not in her debt, though it was true she had done a great deal to help her friend secure her match with Maximilian. It had been Alicia who had gone to talk to him when all had appeared hopeless, and it was she who had persuaded Maximilian of Lily's worth, following the discovery of her being the author of the scandal sheets he had been made the subject of. But Alicia did not want this apparent debt to be repaid through a misguided attempt at garnering romance. She was more than capable of securing a match for herself, or so she believed. There's really no need, Alicia said, but her words fell on deaf ears, deafened further by the arrival of a screaming Emily held in the arms of her nanny. Oh, here she is, my darling child. Look, Emily, your godmother's here. Thank you, nanny. Lily said, holding out her arms to the infant, who now ceased her crying and looked up at Alicia as Lily cradled her to her bosom. Isn't she beautiful? Alicia said, kneeling next to the chaise lounge and placing her finger gently on Emily's lips as she smiled down at her. And soon to have a brother or sister. Maximilian wants a boy, but I'd be quite happy with girls. A dozen girls, she said, laughing as Alicia shook her head. I thought you hated being with child, she said, but Lily shook her head. Oh, but it's all worth it when you see them. Their smiling faces, the joy they bring. I couldn't imagine life without her. I do hope you and Ernest, Lily began, but Alicia interrupted her. I don't think it'll happen, Lily. You're very kind, but I'm sure I'll meet someone in my own time, at the right time. I'm in no hurry and think about you and Maximilian. It was hardly expected, was it? You didn't go out of your way to court his affections. Quite the opposite, in fact, she said. Lily and Maximilian's romance was entirely unexpected. Lily had come to Lancaster in the hope of ruining Maximilian's father, yet, on discovering the truth about him, she had fallen in love with Maximilian. And the rest was history. Love was so often unexpected, it came about under the strangest of circumstances, and Alicia was content to trust the same. Would be the case for her too, given time. No, I s suppose not. But I just want you to be happy, Alicia. You can't live as a spinster forever, can you? Lily said. Alicia shook her head. She knew Lily would not let the matter drop, and if she wanted to invite Isabel to the tea party... So be it. Alicia would smile and converse, she would be pleasant, and when the subject of Ernest was broached, she would speak of how much she had enjoyed their dance together. But as for pushing herself forward and making herself out to be interested in marriage, that was another thing entirely. There were names for the sort of women who sought to further their own position through marriage, and Alicia did not want to gain such a reputation. No, but I can live as one a little longer, I think, she said as Emily started crying again. 
The nanny had been standing patiently in the corner of the room, and now she stepped forward to take the screaming infant in hand. I'll bring her back later, my lady, the nanny said, and she took Emily from the room. The child's crying echoing along the corridor as Lily struggled to her feet and crossed to the window. Wait until the tea party, Alicia. You'll meet Isabel then and be properly introduced. You never know what might happen. I'm sure Ernest hasn't forgotten you. He'll be thinking of you at this very moment. How could he not? You're beautiful, Alicia, and you'll make him the perfect match, she said. Alicia smiled. Lily could be exasperating at times, but she was a good and loyal friend, and Alicia knew she had her best interests at heart. It's very kind of you to say so, Lily, she replied, even as she felt certain nothing would come of her friend's well-meaning interferences. Chapter 2 I don't know why she's asked me. I suppose it's Anne's doing, taking sympathy on me, but I don't really want to go. I won't know anyone apart from Anne, and these society events can be so dull. Isabel Howard said, sighing, as she looked at herself in the mirror above the fireplace in the drawing room at Leamington Grange. Her brother Ernest laughed. His sister had been complaining about the tea party hosted by Lady Oakley all morning, and it seemed she was trying desperately to find an excuse not to go. You might enjoy it. She's quite a character, isn't she? Lady Oakley, I mean, Ernest replied. He took little interest in societal affairs, but had attended the wedding of Lord Maximilian to Lily Edge, and had heard rumours of her past colourful life. She had been the writer of scandal sheets in London, and her words had brought down many a fine and apparently respectable family. Oh, yes, all that business. I don't think it's very nice, though Anne tells me she's quite the reformed character. She's heavily with child. I'm surprised she's playing hostess in such a state. Women usually hide themselves away. Oh, I can't wear this. I'm going to change, Isabel exclaimed. And before Ernest could reply, she had rushed out of the drawing room in a fit of panic. He smiled and shook his head, wondering why a woman as pretty and outgoing as his sister should be, worried about a mere tea party. It'll be just the same as these things always are he thought to himself, recalling the days of his childhood when he would sit in a stiffly starched collar at the tea table with his mother and her friends. As the Duchess of Crawshaw, Ernest's mother was expected to play host to all manner of societal gatherings, and as heir to the dukedom, Ernest too was expected to play his part. But as he had grown older and wiser, Ernest had found his attentions drawn to philanthropy and he used this new found interest as an excuse to avoid society as much as he could. The aristocracy were useful for the depth of their pockets, but as for spending time in their company, the less the better, Ernest said to himself, rising to his feet and crossing to the window. It was late spring, and the gardens of Leamington Grange were bursting into life. His mother prided herself on her garden, and it was tended by a dozen gardeners, the walled kitchen garden being the envy of their neighbours. As he stood looking out across the lawns towards a folly in the distance, a miniature Greek temple built by his great-grandfather, Ernest heard the familiar tapping of his father's stick on the corridor outside the drawing room. The Duke was blind, and he used a stick to navigate his way around the house when there was no one to lead him. "'I'm here, father!' Ernest called out, hurrying to the door and finding the Duke standing in the corridor outside. "'Ah, Ernest, I thought you'd be here. Is your sister there too?' Ernest's father asked. "'No, she's gone to get changed. Again,' he said, and the Duke laughed. "'Just like your mother. Why can't these women accept they're the most beautiful creatures on earth, though I suppose I'm biased? It's a strange thing, you know.' I've never set eyes on either your mother or your sister, but I see them vividly, and I know they're both as beautiful as the other, he said. Ernest smiled. His father's affliction had never held him back, and, growing up, Ernest had often forgotten the Duke could not see. His other senses were so attuned, it was as though he had a sight beyond that of the eyes, 
and he was often the first to anticipate or realise what was happening around them. A distant sound or a scent. When Leamington Grange had suffered a fire in the dining room, it was the Duke who had smelled it first, alerting the servants and saving the house from certain catastrophe. But it was not only the physical senses with which he was endowed, and his perceptions often went far beyond those of others. And she did look beautiful, father, but she's worried about making the right impression. You know how she is, Ernest said. He loved his sister dearly, but he wished she would have more confidence in herself. She was pretty, intelligent and loyal, but so often she felt herself eclipsed by women whose voices were far louder than the depth of their person. Isabel could be shy and retiring, but when she blossomed, it was a delight to see. And she need have no worry in such matters. A red dress, a blue dress, it hardly matters, does it? The Duke replied. Ernest smiled. It certainly did not matter to his father. He could see neither red nor blue. But to Isabel, appearances were important, and Ernest knew she would worry incessantly until the tea party was over. Footsteps now sounded in the corridor, and the door opened, revealing Isabel in a peacock blue dress. She looked at Ernest hesitantly. Is it all right? she asked. You look beautiful, my dear, the Duke said, and Isabel blushed. Oh, father, you're so kind. I don't think I do, but if you say so, she said, glancing at Ernest, who smiled. Father's right, Isabel. You look a picture. It's a lovely dress. Weren't you wearing it at the assembly rooms ball the other evening? He asked. At these words, Isabel's eyes grew wide with fear. Oh, heavens, I was. They'll all see. They'll think I've got no other dresses but this one. I'll have to change, she exclaimed. But Ernest shook his head and folded his arms. No, Isabel, you'll wear that one. It looks perfectly fine to me. You look perfectly fine fine. More so, you look beautiful, Ernest said. He was not about to allow his sister to think less of herself in the eyes of the tun. There was no reason for her to change her dress. No one would notice, and if they did, they should be ashamed of themselves. Isabel sighed. Oh, I wish I didn't worry so much about everything. I just think about what they'll think, she said, looking suddenly forlorn. Well, don't think about it. Anyway, you've not got time to change again. It's nearly two o'clock. Hadn't you better be going? Ernest asked, glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece. Isabel shrieked, clutching her hands to her face. Oh, I'll be late. But won't you come with me, Ernest? I'd feel so much better if you did, she said, her expression becoming imploring. Ernest laughed. What? and sit around with a group of gossiping aristocratic women for the afternoon. I don't think so. Besides, I've not been invited and I've got work to do, he replied, shaking his head. Most of them are unmarried, I think. Just Lily and Anne, they're the wives. The rest are spinsters, Isabel said, as though this would somehow persuade Ernest to accompany her. Ernest made a face. He certainly had no desire to accompany his sister on such an excursion. He had no intention of courting spinsters. The very thought of it horrified him. Ernest had given little thought to marriage. He enjoyed the company of women when it suited him, but always on his own terms, and he was not about to be the object of their interest over tea and scones. I don't care what they are. I'm staying here. Now, you'd better go or you'll be late, he said, and Isabel laughed. Very well. Send me into the lion's den all alone. What do you think of that, father? He's hardly my knight in shining armour, is he? She said, and the duke laughed. I think my daughter's capable of taking care of herself. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon, my darling, he said, raising his hand and waving across the drawing room. Isabel smiled, nodding to Ernest before leaving the room. He shook his head and laughed. I wish she'd gain some confidence, father. What can we do to help her? He asked. But the duke only shrugged. A woman needs to find her place, I suppose. 
I don't know what we can do. Marry her off, that's what lesser men would do. But I'm not prepared to do that. If she marries, I want it to be for love and nothing less. I won't have my daughter living an unhappy life. I came too close to that myself. No, I want both my children to be happy. I'm proud of you both, Ernest, the Duke said, and Ernest smiled. It had not always been thus, but it gladdened his heart to hear his father say as much. The Duke had always tried to instil the values of hard work and determination into both of his children, and Ernest wanted to make him proud, knowing he would one day inherit his father's title. That's kind of you to say, father, Ernest replied, sitting down opposite his father, who now looked straight at him, even as his eyes were blank. You've done something quite remarkable in Manchester, Ernest. A school for blind children. It's unheard of. I count myself lucky to have been born into wealth and privilege. My affliction was always something that could be managed. But to be born blind into poverty, I can only imagine how terrible that must be, he said, shaking his head. Ernest had seen such horrors for himself. In the slums of the cities, a blind child would be a burden, and too often they were sent to the poorhouse, or simply disappeared. Ernest had wanted to do something about it, and the idea of a school with nurses and helpers, a place where blind children could live together and be educated, had been the solution. With his own inheritance from his grandfather, Ernest had set up a foundation, purchasing a disused house in the centre of Manchester and setting about its transformation. He was forever attempting to raise money and had secured the backing of many notable figures, many of whom were his father's friends. And that's what we're trying to solve, father, to get rid of such disadvantage and ensure every child has the help and support they need. As you say, it's one thing to be born into privilege, but quite another, to find oneself born blind into poverty, Ernest replied. He had seen many terrible sights, children abandoned or left to beg on the streets, families evicted from their homes, and mothers forced to choose between feeding themselves or seeing their children starve. There were times when it seemed overwhelming, even as Ernest had done all he could to alleviate the problems. He wanted to leave a legacy and to make the world a better place for those, like his father, who, through no fault of their own, were born blind. And that's why I'm so proud of you, Ernest. You've done what others have failed to do. When I was a child, there was nothing for me, only the attentions of a nanny and my family. But that was only possible because of our privilege. And what I have now is part of that privilege too. But it shows what can be done. Blindness need not be a barrier to a full and happy life. I think back over my own life. I've never allowed my affliction to hold me back, and those children deserve the same. It's the work I should have done myself, but I'm proud to think of my son doing it in my place, he said. Ernest smiled. He was doing what he was doing because of his father. Had the Duke been able to see... Ernest might not have given a second thought to the plight of the blind, but his childhood had been marked by the knowledge his father was different. There were those who had spoken cruelly, openly and behind his back, mocking the Duke and Ernest too. But Ernest's father had always taught him to turn the other cheek and see the prejudices of others as a fault in themselves and not in the ones they ridiculed. I just hope we can make a difference to the lives of the children, Father. It's such a monumental task, but little by little, perhaps things will change, and blindness need not be such a heavy burden for a child to bear, Ernest replied. His father nodded. Your mother and I are immensely proud of you, Ernest, but I shouldn't keep you from whatever the tasks you have before you. Did you enjoy the ball at the assembly rooms the other night? The Duke asked, rising to his feet and taking up his stick. Ernest had given little thought to the ball, though he had been glad to secure several new backers for the school. Yes, it was a pleasant enough evening. I danced with one or two young ladies. They were nice enough. There was one in particular. Oh, what was her name? Alicia, yes, 
That's right. Alicia Saunders. Her father's a wine merchant, I think. We danced a waltz together. It was very pleasant, Ernest said, thinking back to his encounter with the merchant's daughter. She had been fascinated to learn more about the school, and Ernest had told her all about his plans for its future. Will you see her again? The Duke asked, tapping his stick across the drawing floor as he walked towards the door. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Ernest shook his head. He did not think Alicia would have any interest in him. Not in anything more than a social manner at least. Theirs had been a pleasant exchange, but as for anything more. I doubt it. I don't even know if she resides permanently in the county. But she was very pleasant. I think Isabel knows her vaguely. She's somehow connected to Anne and William. But then, isn't someone connected in aristocratic circles? Ernest said, laughing as his father reached the door. The Duke turned and raised his eyebrows. That's very true. Well, I'm going to find your mother. She's probably in the garden. Is it still raining? These spring showers can fall without warning, Ernest's father said. Ernest glanced out of the window. He could see his mother in the rose garden, directing the pruning of a large trailing specimen, clinging to one of the walls. The rain did not perturb her, and he smiled, watching as she gave orders like the captain of a ship. She's out there, I can see her from here, but she's in the middle of what looks like a delicate operation, father, he said, and the duke laughed. Never come between a woman and her roses, not a woman like your mother, anyway. Perhaps I'll just have a glass of brandy in my study, he said, and wishing Ernest a good day, he left the drawing room. Ernest smiled, still watching his mother out of the window. She, like his father, was a remarkable character, and Ernest hoped he possessed, in himself, just a little of them both, even as he was now making his own way in the world. I suppose I should do some work, he thought to himself. But his father's words about the ball had caused him to think back to the evening he had shared with his sister, and as he set about his work, he was surprised to find himself recalling his encounter with Alicia Saunders fondly, and with the hope he might see her again. I don't know why she'll hardly be interested in you, he told himself, shaking his head as he took up his quill to write another letter beginning money for Chapter 3 now, Alicia, you'll sit here next to me, then we'll put Anne here, yes, and Isabel can sit next to her. That way, it won't be obvious we're trying to bring the two of you together in conversation. You and Anne can swap once you're in the throes of establishing a connection. We'll put Florence Digby here. She has a funny obsession with being close to the door. It's some anxiety she has, and next to her, yes, Caroline Pickering. Lily said, counting the chairs, as maids and footmen scurried back and forth preparing the tea table. Alicia had arrived early at Lily's instruction, and the two women had spent the last hour discussing how the subject of Ernest would be broached. Alicia had resigned herself to Lily's intentions, even as she felt certain they would come to nothing, even as Lily was convinced she had found the perfect way to play matchmaker. They were to take tea in the salon, looking out across the gardens. It was a beautiful day, and the doors onto the terrace were open, the sweet scent of the late spring blooms wafting into the room on the warm breeze. Caroline Pickering, she's the daughter of... Alicia began, and Lily finished her sentence. The Viscount Pickering, he is a widower and dotes on Caroline. She gets anything she wants, and she wants a great deal. She's Florence's friend, really, but I thought I should invite her. One doesn't want to make anyone jealous, after all, Lily said, adjusting the teacups on the table, so the handles all face precisely the same way. Is anyone else coming? Alicia ventured, though the current list was formidable enough. Amongst the invitees were the starring names of the county daughters of dukes and viscounts, the wife of a baron, and Lily herself. Alicia felt somewhat out of place, being merely Miss Alicia Saunders. 
the Marchioness of Rapon, Susie Harrell. She's a sweet creature, her husband's ancient. I thought it would be nice to include her. I think she spends most of her time playing bridge with his elderly sisters. But we'll make sure she has a jolly time today. I just hope they don't think badly of me. I can hardly fit into this dress, despite what the Medice did to it. I'm getting bigger by the moment. Do you think we've got enough food? Lily asked, glancing at the table where a mountainous plate of scones had just been deposited by one of the footmen. Alicia smiled and shook her head. I don't think there's any danger of that, Lily, she replied. Anne was the first to arrive, having been instructed to do so by Lily, and was able to reassure their host she looked perfectly turned out in her flowing purple dress and shawl. Everyone knows you're with child, Lily. No one's going to mind, Anne said, glancing at Alicia and smiling. Oh, but I get so worried. I always think people are judging me. I wasn't born to be a duchess. It's not always easy to make the impression one wishes for, Lily replied. Both Alicia and Anne attempted to reassure her, but it was not long before the first guests arrived. Florence Digby and Carolyn Pickering, who had travelled together by carriage. What about a beautiful salon? It must be the finest in the county, Florence exclaimed, gazing around her in awe. The salon had been decorated in a Baroque style, following Lily and Maximilian's visit to the continent after their wedding. The decor was heavy on winged cherubs in gold, and the ceiling had been painted to depict the breaking of the dawn, with pink-tinged clouds greeting the sun. It was not to everyone's taste, certainly not Alicia's, but no one would dare say so, of course. I designed it myself, Lily said, greeting the two women with a kiss. Florence Digby was a large, rotund woman, bigger than Lily, though unmarried and thus not with child. She had a red, beaming face and was dressed in blue, with a fascinator adding height to her already substantial frame. Caroline Pickering was her total opposite, a thin woman with a high brown and ringleted hair, drawn back into a bun. She was wearing a white dress with a lace neckline and pearl earrings to match her necklace. There was an air of slight disdain about her, though she was friendly enough. It's very kind of you to invite us, Lady Oakley, and what a pleasure to come to the house of Burnley Abbey. You've certainly made it your own, she said, glancing around her with a less than approving gaze. It was all plain fabrics and peeling wallpaper when we arrived. I said to Maximilian, I simply must redesign it, she said, inviting the two women to sit down at the tea table. Next to arrive was the Marchioness of Ripon. She was a pretty creature, very timid looking, and dressed in red. She smiled at them each in turn as Lily introduced her. It's a real pleasure to be here. I don't often attend such occasions. My husband's quite ill, you see. I don't like to leave his side, but bless him, he insisted I did. Margaret, his sister, is sitting with him. I say... What a beautiful room this is, she said, gazing around her at the ornate cherubs protruding from the ceiling. We're just waiting for Isabel now, Lily said, taking her place at the head of the table, the others arranged in the seating plan they had earlier decided on. Isabel Howard. She's Ernest Howard's sister, isn't she? Florence said as a footman stepped forward to pour the tea. Alicia shifted slightly in her chair her view blocked by the mountain of scones on the plate in front of her. It seemed our Ernest was well known in county circles, though she herself had only heard of him in passing before the ball at the assembly rooms. That's right, the daughter of the Duke of Crawshaw, the blind Duke, Lily said, and the others nodded. I'm amazed he's still unmarried. They say he's quite the handsomest of men, the Marchioness said, taking a sip of tea. Isabel's a good friend of mine. Her brother's certainly an eligible man. The heir to the dukedom, a man of charity and philanthropy, not to mention good looks, Anne said. Alicia blushed. She felt certain Lily was about to say something about her dancing with Ernest at the ball, but to her relief, Isabel herself was now announced, entering the room with an apologetic exclamation. I am so sorry for being late. I rather underestimated the time it would take. Then there was a herd of sheep on the road up to the estate. 
the farmer just wouldn't move them. It was quite an awkward situation. But I'm here now, she said as Lily rose to greet her. Isabel, how nice to see you. We were just discussing your brother, Lily said, glancing at Alicia, who turned an even deeper shade of red. Oh, don't flatter him, even when he's not here. I'm sure he's the talk of every salon in the county, Lily said, sitting down at the table with a sigh. More tea was brought, and plates of cakes and scones were handed between the women, each of them demolishing more than their fair share. It was a feast, but Alicia remained quiet, hoping Lily would forget the matter she had so enthusiastically spoken of. When's the child due, Lily? It must be soon, Carolyn said. Not soon enough. It should come any day, but... It seems to delight in making me wait, Lily replied, shaking her head. I long for a child, Susie said, looking suddenly very sad. Her husband, the Marquis, had been a widower and already had his son and heir. Alicia felt sorry for Susie, even as she herself did not share such a sentiment or desire. You're always welcome to come here and spend time with my little one. Emily's a delight, Lily said, though, judging by the expression on Susie's face. Alicia did not think it was quite the right thing to say. Talk now turned to charitable endeavours. It seemed all of the women had some cause or other close to their heart, and once again, Alicia felt somewhat inadequate in comparison. It was my mother who got me involved. We just couldn't bear the thought of it. What an abhorrence. These are human beings, snatched from their homelands, and taken thousands of miles across the Atlantic to work as slaves. We simply had to do something. It should be abolished at once, Florence said. She was heavily involved in a campaign to end slavery, and she and her mother were constantly petitioning the great and the good for the matter to be debated in Parliament. The Marchioness did good works amongst fallen women in Lancaster, whilst Anne has thrown herself into helping widowers without means to send their sons to good schools. Only Caroline Pickering seemed without a cause, and when questioned by Lily, she turned the matter towards Isabel. But, of course, none of us can compete with Isabel, or, should I say her brother, she said, taking a sip of tea and looking pointedly at Isabel, who blushed. I can't take any of the credit, though I do help my brother with one or two small tasks by way of contribution. No, it's entirely his doing, the school for the blind children in Manchester. And he hopes to open another one soon. Two, she said. The other women nodded approvingly, and Lily glanced at Alicia, who shifted awkwardly in her chair and turned her attentions to the remnants of the tea table. I think it's admirable. It's just what the aristocracy should be doing. I used to think my family were merely the idle rich, but when I see the things my father-in-law does to help others, and the things Maximilian and William do too, they're philanthropists. They're always trying to help others, Lily said, and Isabel nodded. You're right. Privilege should mean duty. My brother sees that. It wasn't always the case, of course, but he's grown into a fine man. We're so proud of him, Isabel said, smiling as she helped herself to another scone. Alicia's heart was beating fast. She knew Lily was poised to speak and decided to preempt her, knowing the matter would be revealed one way or another. He told me a great deal about it when we danced together at the assembly room's ball, she blurted out, and Isabel looked at her in surprise. Oh, did he? I'm sure he did. It's all he ever talks about, really. He's so taken up by it all. It was all his idea, you see, she said. Alicia was unsure of what to say next. She had enjoyed her conversation with Ernest, though she had not expected ever to recount it, nor had she realised just how popular the heir to the Duke of Crawshaw was amongst women of a certain type. Carolyn Pickering raised her eyebrows. He danced with you, did he? Well, aren't you the favoured one, Miss Saunders? she said, emphasising the miss. Her tone was light-hearted, though there was something of a challenge behind it, and Alicia wondered if she was not stepping into another woman's territory. Did Caroline Pickering have designs on Crawshaw Air? It was just a dance, but very pleasant. He told me all about the school for blind children. 
I was very impressed. I'm going to ask my father to make a subscription, she said, and Isabel clapped her hands together in delight. Oh, are you really? He'll be delighted about that. He works so hard, but it's always an uphill struggle to raise the money. You should come and call on us at Leamington Grange, Alicia. I'm sure my brother would like to meet you again, she said. Alicia blushed, knowing just what Lily was thinking. Her plan had worked perfectly, even as Alicia had expected it to fail spectacularly, and it seemed she now had an open invitation to meet the man. She had thought would not remember her at all. I wouldn't want to impose on you, Alicia replied. She'd be delighted, wouldn't you, Alicia, Lily said. Caroline looked thunderous, even as she forced herself to smile, and Alicia knew she had said entirely the wrong thing in making her association with Ernest known. And we'd be delighted. Perhaps your father could come too. I'm sure he'd like to hear more about where his investment is going. It's good to know the merchant classes share our philanthropic principles, Isabel said. Alicia smiled. She knew Isabel was not being purposefully insulting, even as her words reminded Alicia of her lowly status compared to the others. But as the conversation turned to other topics, and even as Caroline Pickering continued to look angrily across the table at her, Alicia could not help but feel a certain delight in the prospect of seeing Ernest again. She had not expected the invitation to come so easily, nor had she wished to appear as though she was forcing the matter. But Isabel had been insistent, and when the tea party came to an end, she reiterated her invitation. It's been a pleasure to meet you, Alicia said, as the women wished one another goodbye, and Isabel leaned in to kiss her on the cheek. You must come to our garden party on Friday, and bring your father and mother too. My father gives a garden party at the start of the season. You'd be very welcome. We'll all be there, she said, looking hopefully at Alicia, who knew she could not refuse such kindness, even as she felt awkward in accepting. That's very kind of you, she said, and Isabel smiled. I am so glad to hear it. I'll send the details to Lily. We'll see you on Friday. Goodbye, she said, filing out of the drawing room in the company of the other women and leaving Lily and Alicia alone. There, what did I tell you? Lily exclaimed, clapping her hands together in delight. Alicia smiled. She had not meant for it to happen like that, but it seemed fate had intervened and she was destined to meet with Ernest again. It's only a garden party and I doubt he'll be interested in saying more than a few words to me, she replied. But secretly, Alicia was pleased. She had enjoyed dancing with Ernest, and the thought of seeing him again was certainly a pleasing one. Chapter 4 They're all coming, I think. It's the drawer of a conversation with you, Ernest, Isabel said, and Ernest laughed. It was the day of the garden part, and Leamington Grange was a flurry of activity. A marquee had been erected on the lawn, and the footmen were busy carrying tables and chairs from the house, whilst maids hurried back and forth with plates of dainty cakes and sandwiches. Ernest and Isabel were surveying the scene. There had been an annual garden party at Leamington Grange, ever since either of them could remember, a tradition begun by their mother, and now continued by Ernest and his sister. Oh, don't be silly, Isabel. No one wants to talk to me, Ernest replied, and his sister laughed. Nonsense! Don't you know how popular you are in the salons? They're all talking about you, she said, and Ernest groaned. He did not wish to be the centre of attention, though if it meant more money for the school, so be it. He planned to announce plans for expansion that day, having come across the family in Lancaster with a blind child they were struggling to bring up. Ernest had given them money for the boys' schooling, but it seemed there was a need for a school here too, and Ernest intended to see that need realised. I don't relish the fact, he replied, and his sister smiled. But you wouldn't turn them away, would you? If a woman whom you liked showed an interest, she said, and Ernest blushed. I don't think that's going to happen. Besides, I've got more important things to think about today, he replied, and his sister rolled her eyes. Well, I happen to know several of the women coming today are interested in speaking to you. Make sure you find the time, Isabel said. 
Do you mean Caroline Pickering? I don't want to find myself cornered by her. She can be... Very persuasive, Ernest said, thinking back to a previous encounter with the daughter of the Vice Count Pickering. She was a formidable woman, and Ernest had felt somewhat intimidated by her overbearing presence. She'll be here, yes, and Alicia Saunders too. She's a friend of Lady Oakley, the one I went to tea with the other day. I asked Anne to bring them both. You can talk to her. You liked talking to her before. She was full of praise for you, Isabel said, raising her eyebrows and smiling. Ernest made face. He did not like it when his sister played at matchmaking, even as he could not help but feel just a little intrigued as to the thought of meeting Alicia again. She had been in his thoughts, and he had mulled their conversation over in his mind several times, since the night of the assembly room's ball. Well, I'm flattered, I'm sure. I only told her the facts. But look, father and mother are here now, Ernest said, pointing to the terrace, where the Duchess was leading the Duke by the arm. Oh, I'd better go and change. I don't like this dress, Isabel said, but Ernest caught her arm. You don't need to change, Isabel. You're fine as you are. It won't be long until the guests arrive, and I need you to talk to the dull ones, he said. His sister laughed, but she remained at his side, and now their parents came to join them. I can smell a dozen different flowers. The garden must be blooming by now, and isn't it nice to feel the sun on one's face? The Duke said as Isabel slipped her arm into his. Come, father, let's raid the tea table before the plague of locusts arrive. I asked the cook to prepare those delicious tartlets you like so much, she said, leading the Duke towards the marquee. Ernest was left alone with his mother, Grace. The Duchess smiled at him. I must say, it's nice to come to the garden and not have to organise anything myself. You and Isabel have done a marvellous job, Ernest. I hope you get plenty of support for your new endeavour, she said. I hope so too, Mother. It all depends on the generosity of the ton, but I'm sure I can persuade them, he said, and his mother nodded. If anyone can persuade them, it's you, Ernest. You managed it in Manchester and you'll manage it here. We're very proud of you after, well, you've done a great deal to make things better for yourself, she said, and Ernest nodded. He was proud of himself, and having made mistakes in the past, Ernest was keen to make amends. The school for blind children was just the thing to salve his conscience and give him a reason for waking up each morning. His mind was focused on the project at hand, and Ernest was determined to do all he could to realise it. Coming back to Lancashire had been just the right decision. A new start and new opportunities. Thank you, Mother. I was touched when Father told me he was proud of me. That meant a great deal. And I'm so very grateful to you both. I really am, Ernest said. His mother smiled and slipped her hand to his. I know it hasn't always been easy for you, Ernest. Growing up, your father's affliction wasn't understood and other people were cruel. But you've done so much to take away the stigma of blindness, particularly in children. It's admirable, she said, just as voices on the terrace announced the arrival of the first guests. Ernest turned to find a sudden influx of the great and the good of the county's society entering the garden. There was much delighted exclamation at the sight of the flower beds in bloom and the abundant tea tables. Drinks were soon being circulated, and the ton settled into doing what they did best, having the same conversations as they had done at the previous social gathering and the one before that. Opinions were exchanged, actions were debated, and news, or rather gossip, was shared. Ernest flitted from group to group, thanking them for coming and wishing them a pleasant afternoon. It's really very good of you to invite us, Ernest, I must speak to your father before the end of the afternoon. I've got a proposal for him. Dull business for the House of Lords, but it's got to be done. I want to make a donation, though, Ralph Oakley, the Duke of Lancaster, said, catching Ernest's arm as he passed. That would be very kind of you, Your Grace. And might you consider sitting on the Board of Governors for the school I hope to establish here in Lancashire? Your patronage would make a considerable difference, I'm sure. 
Ernest said. The Duke smiled. I'd be delighted, and I'm sure either William or Maximilian would be willing to do so too, he said. Ernest thanked him, glancing over the Duke's shoulder and catching the eye of the woman he had danced with at the assembly room's ball. She was a pretty creature, with blonde hair hanging down to her shoulders in ringlets, and a rosy-cheeked face with dark brown eyes. She was wearing a peacock blue dress and looked extremely attractive standing next to Lily, Maximilian's wife, and the Duchess of Lancaster, Miriam Oakley. Oh, that's very kind of you, Your Grace, Ernest stammered, distracted for a moment by Alicia's smile. He excused himself, hurrying across the garden to where his sister was directing the servants to bring out the next round of refreshments. I think it's going very well so far. I do love garden parties. In the sunshine, at least, Isabel said. Ernest smiled, glancing back over his shoulder to where Alicia now had her back turned to him, in conversation with Lily and Maximilian. Oh, yes, it's going very well, isn't it, he said, and his sister smiled. Have you spoken to her yet? She asked, and Ernest shook his head. No, I've been too busy, he replied, and Isabel rolled her eyes. Oh, just do it, Ernest. You don't need anyone's permission, and certainly not Caroline's, if that's who you're worried about, she said. Ernest had not yet spoken to the Viscount's daughter either, though he knew he would have no choice but to do so before the afternoon was over. She had arrived with a grand entrance on her father's arm, wearing a long, flowing yellow dress and carrying a large parasol in hand. Ernest had no desire to speak to her, even as he knew she had the power to see his project for a school in Lancaster come to completion. Her father was amongst the richest men in England and had already done much to sponsor the school in Manchester. Speaking to her would be unavoidable, even as he now walked behind the marquee to avoid her. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I saw you looking at him, Alicia, and he looked at you too, Lily said, raising her eyebrows as Lily blushed. He was just being friendly. A smile doesn't mean a courtship, she said, and Lily sighed. A smile alone doesn't mean a courtship, but a dance, a smile, a conversation, a compliment, all these things matter. It's the little things that lead to the large things. Don't you think so? She said. They had stepped away from the rest of the Oakley family and were talking quietly by the entrance to the marquee. Alicia had enjoyed the afternoon, even as she had found Lily's constant agitations over Ernest, somewhat trying. It seemed Lily was determined to make a match, and, with Isabel having provided the perfect social setting, there would be little choice for Alicia but to allow herself to be carried al along by the possibility of a further introduction to Ernest. I suppose so, but he's busy... He's going to announce something, Isabel said, something about a new school in Lancaster. That's why we're here, isn't it? Alicia said. Her father had agreed to make a substantial donation to the project, as had Maximilian, William and the Duke of Lancaster. It seemed the plight of the blind children had touched the hearts of many, and there was a genuine desire to see the project established. Oh, yes, but that won't take long. Why don't you get us both a glass of punch? I'll go and look for him, Lily said, and before Alicia could protest, Lily had hurried off in search of Ernest. Alicia sighed. There could be no persuading Lily. Once she had an idea in her mind, she was like a horse chomping at the bit. Alicia made her way into the marquee. It was open at both ends and attended by several footmen. Two glasses of punch, please, Alicia said, and the footman poured out the two glasses with a ladle from an enormous punch bowl on a table decorated with flowers. The refreshments had been delicious, all manner of dainty cakes, sandwiches and morsels. Alicia thanked the footman, but instead of making her way back out to where the guests were congregated, she made for the open back door of the marquee, hoping for a few moments respite from Lily's attentions. She did not resent her friend for her efforts, but she was simply not interested in pursuing a man who clearly had more important things to think about than courting a vague acquaintance like her. Why would he be interested? She thought to herself, shaking her head. 
But as she emerged from the marquee, her thoughts distracted by her frustrations at Lily, she collided head-on with a figure coming the other way. The glasses of punch flew into the air, covering the man with the sweet-smelling liquid, as Alicia let out a cry. Oh, I'm so sorry, Alicia exclaimed, realising to her horror who it was she had just covered in punch. Ernest smiled, stepping back, his shirt and cravat now stained red. He looked down at himself and laughed. Well, I suppose it's better to be turned red this way than stabbed. I'm sorry, Miss Saunders, it was my fault. I didn't see you, I was thinking about... Well, something else. You're not similarly covered, are you? He asked, and Alicia shook her head. The punch had gone forward, and the soaking was entirely his. She blushed with embarrassment, feeling terrible for what she had done, even as she could see he was treating the whole thing with amusement. No, but look at your shirt. It's completely ruined. I'm so sorry. I was daydreaming, and... She said, blushing as much at the object of her daydreams as her encounter with that object. There's no harm done. I can slip inside and change my shirt. It'll give me an excuse to get away. I don't really like these sorts of things. That's why I'm hiding back here, I suppose. I detest talking to people. I mean, not that I detest talking to you, but... He said, looking suddenly embarrassed. I understand. I often feel out of place at these sorts of gatherings. Everyone's got a title but me, she said, revealing her insecurities to him. He looked at her sympathetically and shook his head. There's really no need to feel like that, Miss Saunders, though some of the people here can be terrible snobs. But one has to tolerate them. I need their money, he said, raising his eyebrows, and Alicia laughed. I'm sure you can be very persuasive, my lord. I asked my father to give a donation, and he was more than happy to do so. I believe a lot of people are doing so. It's an admirable cause, she said, and Ernest smiled. It's good of you to say so, Miss Saunders. Not everyone understands it, of course. They question the point of educating children who can't see. They ask what possible contribution they can make, but the answer's clear. An educated child, whether blind or not, can make a difference. My father's living proof of that. He is my inspiration, you see. I'm doing what I'm doing because of him, he said. Alicia could not help but admire Ernest in turn. He was an inspiration, and Alicia felt a sudden and strong desire to do something to help, even as it seemed the Duke did not recall the two of them having danced at the assembly room's ball. At this thought, she felt something of a disappointment, even as the Duke could not possibly be expected to remember everyone he had met or danced with. But as their conversation continued, the two of them hidden behind the marquee, Alicia could not help but be caught up in the pleasantness of his company, and while she felt embarrassed at having covered him in punch, she wondered if there was not something providential in this unexpected encounter. Chapter 5 Ernest was glad to have escaped the attentions of the other guests, and whilst his shirt was stained red with punch, he could not help but feel glad to have made the acquaintance of the woman in whose company he now found himself. She was a vivacious delight, and the more they talked, the more he found himself attracted to her, even as he knew he still had duties to perform that afternoon. It's very good of your father to promise a donation. He's in the wine trade, isn't he? A merchant, Ernest said, and Alicia nodded. That's right. He started with nothing but his wits, and now he's one of the most successful wine importers in the country. He supplies the Duke of Lancaster, amongst others, Alicia replied. Ernest nodded. He knew it would not be the aristocracy who would fund his plans for the expansion of the schools. Old money was rapidly being replaced by new, and the inheritance of a title was no guarantee of wealth. Ernest knew titled men without a penny to their name and commoners whose wealth extended far beyond the wildest dreams of most aristocrats. If men like Alicia's father could be persuaded as to the merits of the schools, then their future was guaranteed. He's done well for himself. I admire that. Too many of my kind rest on their laurels. They spend money, but don't know how to make it. I'm forever having to think of ways to make money. The school in Manchester doesn't run itself. 
We rely entirely on charitable donations, and the school in Lancaster will be the same. I hope I'm not boring you, am I? Ernest said, suddenly fearing he had spoken of nothing else but his own projects for the past few minutes, but Alicia shook her head. She seemed entirely enamoured by what he was saying and repeated her desire to help. I feel quite useless at times. What does a woman like me do? I'm not an aristocrat, I'm not invited to every salon in the county, but nor do I have any need for gainful employment. I want to do something. I want to help, and I can't think of a better cause than yours, she said. Ernest smiled. He was glad to hear it, and he felt certain he could find any number of things for her to help him with. Ernest was good at the business side of things. He could raise money, manage projects, and ensure the schools were run as he wished. But there were times he found it difficult to engage with the children under his care, and this was certainly something Alicia could help him with. He wanted to make those connections, and for the children to know that they were loved and taken care of. I'm sure you can help. Tell me, do you have much experience with the blind, or with children? He asked. Alicia looked suddenly perturbed and shook her head. I, no, I don't. I know your father's blind, but I don't know anyone else who is. And obviously I don't have children myself. I don't even have nieces and nephews or younger siblings. Perhaps I'm not really what you need, she said, but Ernest shook his head. Not at all. You're absolutely what I need. It's just... It can be difficult. I grew up knowing my father was blind. It never occurred to me there was something strange in leading him by the hand or describing the view across the garden. But most people don't know what it's like to be blind. Thank goodness. It impacts everything one does. And for children, it can be terribly frightening and disconcerting. A blind child can think themselves entirely alone in the world. But in a school like mine, they find a place of belonging. They realise they're not alone, and that's a wonderful gift, Ernest said. Alicia smiled at him, and he hoped he had not put her off the idea of helping him in his work. She was a delightful creature, and he felt certain she would be a wonderful asset to the project of building a school for blind children in Lancaster. I think it's inspiring, and if you'll allow the possibility of my making a few mistakes along the way, I'd be delighted to help you. Alicia said. Ernest smiled at her. I won't even mind if you spill punch over me again, Miss Saunders, he said, and Alicia blushed. I'll try not to, she replied, as Ernest realised how long they had been talking. He would have been missed by now, and his shirt was still stained and in need of a change. But he was finding it hard to tear himself away, even as a sudden thought now occurred to him. Forgive me for my ignorance, but we've shared a dance, haven't we? Please tell me I'm not imagining it, he said, for he would have felt a terrible fool had he been wrong. But to his relief, Alicia nodded. That's right. At the assembly rooms ball, I didn't like to mention it in case... Well, I'm glad you remembered, she said. Ernest felt embarrassed. He did remember, and the memory was a pleasant one. It had been the last dance, and Alicia had been standing by the punch bowl when Ernest had approached her. Might I have this dance? he had asked, and he remembered her pretty peacock blue dress and matching fascinator. She had gladly accepted, but when the waltz had come to an end, they had gone their separate ways, and Ernest had presumed she had forgotten him. But it seemed Alicia too had remembered that brief encounter, and now fate had brought them together once again. I do remember, I didn't want to presume you did though, I'm sure you've danced with any number of men since then. I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean... Ernest stammered, realising what he had just said, even as Alicia smiled. Not many, but one does, I suppose. And men dance with any number of women, don't they? She said. Ernest blushed. Yes, I suppose they do. But most are far less memorable, he said for he remembered everything about the dance they had shared. The depth of her gaze, the smile on her face, the poise and precision of her movements. But you remembered the dance we shared, 
she asked, and Ernest nodded. I do, and I'm glad you do too. I'm sorry we lost touch, or rather, I'm sorry I made no attempt to keep in touch. I should have offered to call on you, or it's just, I get so caught up in my work, you see. It consumes me at times. I don't think about anything else, Ernest admitted. He had often neglected aspects of his personal life for the good of that greater cause he saw as he, as his vocation, friendships, his own interests, romance. All came second to his desire to help others, particularly the blind children he cared about so much. Alicia looked at him sympathetically. I understand, and I didn't expect anything further of you that evening. We danced, it was very pleasant, and we parted a company amicably. I thought about you, though. In the days to come, I mean, she said, and Ernest smiled. I thought about you too, and I'm very glad to make your acquaintance again, Ernest replied, smiling at Alicia, who blushed and averted her gaze. He was about to say something else to tell her she looked very pretty, and to suggest he might call on her, when a shrill voice, that of Lady Caroline, came from the open door of the marquee behind. Oh, there you are, Ernest. I've been looking for you everywhere, so has my father. Aren't you coming to make the announcement? Oh, Alicia, you're here too. What's happened to your shirt, Ernest? Caroline asked, glancing at the stains and raising her eyebrows. Ernest blushed, even as Alicia answered the question. It was just an accident, Caroline. I wasn't looking where I was going. We bumped into one another, Alicia said, and Ernest nodded. He did not like the way Carolyn pried into his business, even as he knew he had no choice but to be gracious towards her. Upsetting her would upset her father, and if her father was upset, the funding for the school would be withdrawn. Ernest could not afford to lose such valuable support, even as he knew it came at a price. That's right. I'd better go and change before I make the announcement, Ernest said, glancing at Alicia, who blushed. I'll come with you. I'll tell them you're ready to make the announcement, Caroline said, and before um, Ernest could protest, she had marched off in the direction of the house, beckoning him to follow her. Glancing back at Alicia, he felt terribly embarrassed, but had no choice but to follow Caroline, even as he wished he could remain at her side. He had enjoyed their conversation and wished it could be prolonged, but duty called, and the guests were waiting for the announcement. Caroline, I... Ernest called out, and she turned, fixing him with a questioning look. Yes. Is something wrong? She asked, and Ernest sighed. No. Nothing's wrong. I'm just not sure... Well, the announcement, he said, for he was not entirely sure what to say, other than explaining his plans. Ernest was not a good public speaker. He preferred to work quietly and diligently behind the scenes, rather than pushing himself forward into the centre of attention. Oh, you'll be quite all right, Ernest. You don't need to say a great deal. Just explain the project. Mention my father, and I'm sure others will follow suit. You'll have all the donations you need. Don't worry, I'll be there too, Caroline said, and Ernest nodded. That was his fear. She had already ingratiated herself in any number of ways, making out to be an essential asset to the project, one Ernest could not do without. To upset her now would jeopardise his plans, even as Ernest would rather see Alicia as his assistant. Yes, well... Ernest began, but Caroline interrupted him. Hurry and get changed. I'll tell your sister we're nearly ready for the speech, she said, and Ernest nodded, resigned, it seemed, to his fate. Making his way into the house, he found one of the housemaids, instructing her to bring a clean shirt from the laundry and going upstairs to change. As he came to the landing, he was surprised to see his sisters leaving her bedroom, and he looked at her questioningly as she turned. Oh, Ernest, I was just powdering my nose. I wanted to get away from Caroline Pickering. She's insufferable, she said, and Ernest smiled. You're right, she is. I've just met her outside. She was looking for you. But We've no choice but to be gracious towards her, Ernest replied. His sister sighed. You might not have a choice, she said, but Ernest raised his eyebrows. 
any offence she takes could be used as an excuse to interfere with her father's support, he said, and Isabel shook her head. You know what she wants, don't you? She said, and Ernest grimaced. He knew just what she wanted, to have the title of Duchess of Crawshaw. Caroline's father had made no secret of the ambitions he harboured for his daughter, even as Ernest had no intention of making them come true. If he was to marry, he would not marry her. But the threat of blackmail hung over him, and Ernest knew the Viscount Pickering could be very persuasive if he chose to be. Oh, but you don't think he would go that far, do you? Ernest asked, and his sister shrugged her shoulders. I don't know, but you need to be careful, Ernest. You've seen what she's like, the way she takes over, she said, and Ernest sighed. I was just talking to Alicia Saunders. She's quite something, he said as his sister now looked down at his shirt. What happened to you? she asked, and Ernest now explained how he had encountered Alicia at the back of the marquee, the two of them bumping into one another before sharing a pleasant conversation. I think she's a delight, and she wants to help our cause too. She's keen to be involved, and I want her to be. Her father's a rich man, but that's not the only reason. I'd rather she be involved than Caroline Pickering, he said, lowering his voice. I agree, but will Mr Saunders give quite so much money? You'd better go and change your shirt. They'll be expecting you outside, Isabel said, and Ernest nodded, thanking his sister, before hurrying to his bedroom, where the maid had laid out a freshly pressed shirt. As he changed, Ernest thought back to his encounter with Alicia. He hoped he would see her again before the end of the garden party, and wondered how best to approach the possibility of her assisting with the opening of the school in Lancaster. I can't offend Caroline, but I'd much rather it be Alicia who assisted me, Ernest thought to himself, as now he made his way back downstairs and out into the garden. The crowds were milling about expectantly, and the last of the refreshments had been demolished. A small platform had been erected beneath the shady branches of a tall oak tree, and, as Ernest approached, the shrill voice of Caroline called out to him. "'Do you need any assistance, Ernest?' she asked. They did not know one another well, but Caroline always referred to Ernest by his Christian name, and never with deference to his title. With a sigh, he turned, finding her hurrying towards him. "'I'm just going to make the announcement now,' he said, and she nodded. "'Very good. Don't forget to emphasise the need for donations.' We need as many people as possible to contribute. Some more than others, she said, glancing to where the Duke of Lancaster was in conversation with his son, Maximilian. I know, and many people have already agreed to contribute, Ernest replied. He had raised the funds for the school in Manchester, and he would do the same for the school in Lancaster. But it seemed Caroline was determined to interfere, making the matter her own, and no doubt taking the credit for it. Yes, but you need to make sure they understand the urgency. I'm here to help you, Ernest, but I can't do it for you, she said. Ernest did not remember specifically asking for her help, nor did he recall the moment when her interest for the project came to the fore. But she had made it her own, and it seemed Ernest had no choice to allow her interference to continue. The Viscount's donations matched those of all the other donors put together, and it seemed to Ernest there was a determination to buy his affections through charitable donation, thus serving the interests of Caroline Pickering too. Ernest was not blind to this, even as he felt trapped by the facts. I'd better go and make the announcement, he said, and she nodded. Then come back and talk to me, we've got a great deal to discuss, she said, smiling at him flirtatiously. Chapter 6 Alicia had been watching this scene play out from a distance. She felt confused as to Ernest's interest in Carolyn Pickering and her interest in him. Her conversation with Ernest had been a pleasant one, after the embarrassment of the spilled punch had been forgotten, but the arrival of Caroline had changed things. It had seemed to Alicia as though Ernest was enthralled to the Viscount's daughter. He had done just what she had told him, and now they were deep in conversation by the small podium on which Ernest was about to give his speech. It's been a delightful afternoon, hasn't it? 
Where did you go? Lily said as Alicia came to stand next to where her friend was sitting beneath a parasol, fanning herself in the heat. Oh, I ran into Ernest. Quite literally, I spilled punch all over his shirt. It was terribly embarrassing, but then we were talking, Alicia said, thinking back fondly to the conversation she had shared, and still feeling surprised as to his recollection of the dance they had shared. Lily looked up at him and smiled. You see, she said, and Alicia rolled her eyes. I don't see anything, apart from Caroline Pickering, of course, Alicia said, glancing over to where the Viscount's daughter was hustling Ernest towards the stage. Lily's eyes narrowed and she nodded. Yes, she always gets what she wants, doesn't she? She said. Well, I don't know what she wants or what he wants. He remembered our dance, but he was very pleasant. But then she appeared and it was as though she was jealous. I'd offered to help with the school. I'd like to help with the school. But I don't think she's going to let me, Alicia said, feeling suddenly sad at the thought of rejection. Caroline Pickering was a snake in the grass. She had been polite enough, but behind her facade, Alicia had seen a jealous look in her eyes. She had not wanted Alicia anywhere near Ernest and had been certain to steer him rapidly away from any potential threat. Alicia had seen the same look at Lily's tea party and she felt certain Caroline Pickering could make herself a formidable opponent if she chose to be. Oh, nonsense! What business is it of hers? If the Duke's son wants your help, so be it. You've offered it, he can choose to accept it, Lily said, waving her hand dismissively. But Alicia was not convinced. I don't know. I like him, but I'd be stepping on another woman's feet. He was very pleasant, but if he's already spoken for, she said even as Ernest called out for the attention of the gathered crowd. My friends, good afternoon, and may I welcome you all to Lemington Grange on this fine and sunny afternoon. I do hope you've all enjoyed yourselves. It's been my pleasure to have you here as our guests and I extend to you the warmest greetings of my mother and father, the Duke and Duchess too, he said. A polite round of applause rang out across the garden, and Alicia watched as Ernest stood on the stand with Caroline at his side. What were her intentions? Were the two of them to be married? It was all very confusing, even as Alicia wondered whether she wanted to be involved at all. It could be very complicated, she thought to herself, sighing as Ernest continued. In welcoming you here this afternoon, I'm afraid to say I had an ulterior motive, though I'm sure you've all realised what it is, he said, and a murmur of laughter rippled through the crowd. We certainly knew that, Lily said, glancing at Maximilian, who smiled. A worthy cause, he replied. But, my friends, this ulterior motive seeks to bring hope to those who so often feel hopeless, those without their sight, and not just those whose sight fails them in later years, but those poor, unfortunate souls, born without the gift we each take for granted. As a child, I grew up knowing my father was different. He was blind, he is blind, and only rank and privilege have allowed him to live a full and satisfying life. Too many blind children are left behind, and I want to change that. My school for blind children in Manchester is already seeing remarkable results, and I want to extend that opportunity here, to Lancaster, Ernest continued. Another round of polite applause rang out, and heads were known nodded in agreement and support. An excellent idea, Ralph, the Duke of Lancaster said, and others expressed similar sentiments. With that in mind, I have already identified a building and made preliminary inquiries as to the feasibility of establishing a school there. The first signs are promising, and I feel certain, with your help, we can make the dream of a school here, in Lancaster for blind children, a reality, Ernest concluded. He was about to step down from the platform when, to his surprise and that of the crowd, Caroline Pickering stopped him. I want to say a few words in support of Ernest she said, and Alicia watched as Ernest drew a sharp intake of breath and forced a smile onto his face. That's very kind of you, Caroline, he replied as the Viscount's daughter addressed the crowd. 
The establishment of these hospitals wouldn't be possible without the generous support of my father, the Viscount Pickering. We'd like to thank him on behalf of all the children under our care and urge those of you with the means to help to do so. A few guineas might not seem a lot to those of us with plenty, but it can mean the difference between a life of poverty and a life of productivity for the children we take care of, she said. Alicia glanced at Lily, who rolled her eyes. If we were on the continent, she'd expect to be canonised. Look at her showing off. It's quite distasteful, Lily said, tutting, as Caroline's words were met with polite applause. She beamed, turning to Ernest, who looked thoroughly embarrassed. Well, I'll happily contribute, but Ernest's speech was enough to make me do so, the Duke of Lancaster said, and it seemed Caroline's words had served only to annoy rather than encourage. The philanthropy of the Viscount Pickering was well known. He made sure of that, but Alicia knew the generosity of the Duke of Lancaster, whose kindness had helped many in need, and without the show of allowing the left hand to see what the right hand was doing. I think it's admirable, Lily said as the garden party continued. I offered to help, but I don't think Caroline would let me, Alicia said, feeling disappointed. She needed something to do. Her parents were back and forth between London and Bath, and despite being in the midst of the season, Alicia felt directionless. She lacked a purpose, or so she felt, and was not content with the purpose assigned to so many other young ladies of her privilege. Tea parties, soirees, picnics and balls were all very well, but they gave little by way of purpose. Alicia wanted to feel useful, and the prospect of working for Ernest's cause had presented that possibility, only for it to be seemingly snatched away by the jealousies of Caroline Pickering. Oh, nonsense! Since when did she dictate what you can and can't do? If you want to help Ernest, and if he wants you to help, so be it. You should do so, Alicia, Lily said. Alicia sighed. She was not possessed of her friend's outgoing nature. Lily always got what she wanted, but Alicia always seemed to be two steps behind. She did not have the confidence of the woman who'd once spent her days discovering scandal and publishing it to the ruin of any who dared stand in her way. I don't know. Do you think he still wants me to help? She asked, and Lily nodded. I'm certain he does. You saw the look on his face when she stepped up to speak. You're a far better choice than her. Go and speak to him. Look, he's over there by himself. His sister's just been talking to him. Now's your chance, Lily said, and to Alicia's surprise, she gave her a hard shove, pushing her towards Ernest, so she had no choice but to step forward and speak to him. He looked up at her and smiled, even as Alicia felt the blush rising in her cheeks. I... I see you changed your shirt, she said, uttering the first thing she could think of. He looked down at his clean shirt and laughed. You're not going to the punch bowl again, are you? He asked, and Alicia blushed an even deeper shade of red. No, I... I thought what you said was very fine. I'm sure lots of people are going to donate to the cause, she said, hoping she would not sound foolish, even as he smiled at her and nodded. That's kind of you. I hope they will. I think they will. It's... He began but he was interrupted by that same shrill voice from before. Ernest, you must go and speak to the Countess of Lingerby. She wants to make a substantial donation. I've told her we'll be only too pleased to accept, Caroline said, glancing at Alicia with a forced smile. But behind her, smile was a different expression, one Alicia knew to be jealousy. The Countess of Lingerby might have promised a few guineas, but Caroline's intention was to draw Ernest away. It was a competition one Alicia had no intention of taking part in. The Duke's son looked embarrassed. I was just speaking to Miss Saunders. She's going to help me with establishing the school here, just as I explained, Ernest said. Alicia was glad to hear him stand up for himself, and surprised too. She had assumed the two of them were caught in a romantic tryst, but it seemed Sir Ernest had little desire to do as he was told, despite Caroline's forceful personality. 
For a moment, the Viscount's daughter looked taken aback, but a smile was quickly forced onto her face, and she nodded, taking a deep breath and nodding. Yes, I'm sure we'll be uh, delighted to have her assistance, she said, and Ernest nodded. I know we will, and I hope you'll agree to it, Miss Saunders, he said, turning to Alicia, who had now made up her mind to help. Lily would not have been cowed by Caroline, and neither would she. I will, thank you. I can think of no better cause to lend my support to, she said. But at that moment, Caroline began to sob. It was all theatrics, of course, but she made a great show of emotion, causing Ernest to look at her with concern. Oh, Ernest, when I think of those poor children, it brings me to tears. I don't know how you and Miss Saunders can keep from weeping. Blindness, it's terrible, she exclaimed, holding out her arms so as to force Ernest to comfort her. Alicia rolled her eyes. Caroline was being ridiculous. Her concern for the blind children was secondary to her intentions for Ernest. He was the reason for her weeping charity, and it was becoming ever clearer what her intentions were. It's quite terrible to think of it, Alicia said, glancing at Ernest, who had his arms awkwardly around Caroline, who was now clinging to him with tears rolling down her cheeks. Oh, yes, Miss Saunders, you're quite right. It's just terrible. How grateful we are to you for coming to our aid, Caroline said, once again emphasising her connection to Ernest, who was looking thoroughly uncomfortable. Here, Caroline, take my handkerchief, he said, pulling away from her embrace, and offering her his handkerchief, which she took with a look of the utmost gratitude. I'm sorry, but one can't help but be moved to tears over the plight of those poor children. We're so fortunate in you. Ernest, and with Miss Saunders's help, I'm sure it won't be long before the school opens and we welcome the first children through its doors. Think of what we can do, she exclaimed, the she tears now replaced with a beaming smile. But in her performance, Alicia knew Caroline had intended a message to be conveyed. She had wanted Alicia to know her intentions towards Ernest, and that she was capable of manipulating him to do her will leaving Alicia wondering if he would be strong enough to resist her. I'm sure we can achieve a great deal, Alicia said, and Caroline nodded, reaching out and taking Alicia's hand in hers. I know we'll be the best of friends, Alicia. I just know it. We've got so much in common, she said, glancing at Ernest, who smiled. I'm glad you both agree, he said, even as it seemed he was less keen on the proposed match than he was forced to state. Well then, that's settled, isn't it? We'll do such good work for the poor children and we'll see the school built in no time. Now, Ernest, come and speak to the Countess. Then you can speak to my father. He's keen to discuss some things with you, Caroline said, pulling Ernest away, even as he glanced back at Alicia, who sighed. Caroline's strategy was clear. She would not allow Alicia and Ernest to spend any time together and would make out as though she being with them was necessary for the success of the project. But Alicia would not be cowed, knowing what Lily would say if she backed down now, and as she returned to her friend's side, she felt determined in the task ahead. Well, did you do it? Lily asked, and Alicia nodded. We're going to work together, the three of us, she said, and Lily raised her eyebrows. The three of you? A menage a trois? I wrote about enough of those to know they never end happily, Alicia. Don't let yourself be hurt, Lily said, looking at Alicia with concern. But I thought you'd be happy for me. She's got her talons in him, but he's not comfortable with it. I can see it in his eyes. She burst into floods of tears just now, weeping for the children. But they were crocodile tears. She only did it to get his attention, and it worked. She doesn't care about the children, not really. She cares about her own position, and she wants to marry him. She wants to be a duchess, Alicia said. Lily smiled. Don't, most women. Well, I didn't, I suppose. But you're right, Alicia, you shouldn't back down. Let her think what she likes about the two of you working together. But when it comes to it, Ernest can't favour her over you. It's impossible. I know just what she's like, Lily said, and Alicia nodded. She too was realising what Caroline was like, 
and if Ernest was not careful, he may well find himself in a situation he could not extract. Chapter 7 She never left your side, not for a moment. I felt so sorry for Alicia, Isabel said, tutting and shaking her head. The garden party had come to an end, and the guests had departed, leaving only Caroline and her father, the two of them having just left after a lengthy conversation about the building they intended for the school. Ernest and Isabel had retreated to the drawing room, their parents having gone upstairs to rest, and now I, Ernest thought back to the conversation he had had with Caroline's father, fearing it would mean a troubled future for him. You'll have no trouble securing the funds, I assure you, the Viscount had said, smiling at Ernest, who had thanked him graciously, even as he realised the Viscount was continuing to buy his goodwill. It was all for Caroline, and whilst Ernest was reluctant to be a pawn in the Viscount's game, he feared he had no choice but to play along. The money raised from the garden part had been substantial. The Duke of Lancaster, in particular, had been generous in his support, but none of the donations had come close to matching that of the Viscount, whose generosity appeared to know no bounds. We can start immediately, Carolyn had said, making no reference to Alicia, and insisting on accompanying Ernest on his next visit to the proposed building. Little by little, she and her father were taking over the project, and Ernest had no choice but to be grateful to them for their contribution. He needed it, and he knew too the price to be paid. She's insatiable, and then there were the tears. She burst into floods of tears over the children. It's all to get my attention, of course, but what else can I do? Ernest asked, for he felt manipulated even as his sister shook her head. You can tell her to stop being so foolish. It's ridiculous, Ernest, she said, shaking her head. Isabel was not the sort of woman to suffer fools gladly, nor did she take kindly to displays of hysterics. Ernest knew she disliked Caroline, though she tolerated her for much the same reasons as he was forced to do. To upset Caroline would be to jeopardise the plans for the school. She had power, and she knew how to use it. But I can't do that. You know I can't. She wants to be the one to take the glory. And her father... Well, you know what he wants... Ernest replied, shaking his head and sighing at the thought of what was expected of him. The Viscount was keen to make a match, to see Caroline married and her future secured. He was doing all of this for her. The cause was immaterial, but the prize was not. Ernest had given little thought to marriage, though he had thought a great deal about avoiding it. He was not ready to marry, or rather, he had not yet found a woman he wished to marry, though his encounter with Alicia had given rise to thoughts he had not entertained before. She was a charming, attractive young woman, possessed of considerable and impressive talent. Ernest's memory of the dance they had shared together was a pleasant one, and he would gladly have gotten to know her better, had it not been for the shadow looming over him. And you don't have to agree to it, Ernest. Not at all. Why should you? If he was truly generous and truly cared about the children, he'd give you the money whether you married Caroline or not. You're not a thing to be purchased, Isabel said, letting out an exasperated sigh. But I... Oh, don't say that, Isabel. It makes me feel terribly depressed. But... The school... We can't open the school without his money. You know that, Ernest replied. His sister looked at him and shook her head. And you'd sacrifice your happiness for the school? She asked. Ernest nodded. He knew of no other way, and he was not about to see the children he cared for cast out by the selfishness of a man who would only give away his fortune on the condition of marriage. If marrying Caroline Pickering meant he could help those poor children, then so be it. Haven't I already made enough mistakes? Isn't this the moment to atone for them? Ernest replied, shaking his head and slumping back in his chair, despairing at the thought of what would happen if the school was not built. His sister slipped her hand into his with a sympathetic look on her face. You don't always have to blame yourself for the past, Ernest. Haven't you done enough atoning? Isabel said. 
his sister had always been generous towards Ernest's faults. But Ernest himself was less forgiving. He felt a deep sense of guilt for his past and the mistakes he had made. The school for blind children was a way not only of forgiving himself, but of thanking his father for helping him when he needed it the most. But I do blame myself, Isabel. No one else spent all that money in gambling dens. No one else was responsible for the sadness I caused to Eleanor. It was all me, Isabel. I feel... Shame, Ernest said, pulling away from Isabel, leaning forward and placing his head in his hands. That shame was absolute, and not a day went by when Ernest did not think of the terrible things he had done when his life had been at its lowest. It had all started innocuously enough, the pleasure of the card table at his club. But little by little, Ernest's habits had grown darker and ever greater sums of money had exchanged hands. He had swapped the convivial atmosphere of his gentleman's club for salubrious dens of vice, where fortunes were won and lost and reputations built or destroyed. Ernest's own reputation had lain in tatters, and when the extent of his losses had been revealed, and he had finally admitted the terrible problems besetting him, it had been too late to salvage his burgeoning romance with the daughter of the first sea lord, Lady Eleanor Simpkins. But that doesn't mean you'll always feel shame, Ernest. Nor should you. You've left all that behind. Father doesn't hold it over you, does he? She asked, and Ernest shook his head. His father had been a model of virtue in his dealings with Ernest's faults. Not once had he raised his voice or uttered a note of disappointment. His solution had been entirely pragmatic. He had paid off Ernest's debts and come to an amicable agreement with Eleanor's father. They had parted ways, and any whisper of a scandal had been kept quiet. But Ernest's guilt had remained, and he knew just how close to utter disaster he had come. I know he doesn't, but he should. I did a terrible thing, Isabel. If Caroline knew it, well, her father might not be so generous. And as for Alicia, he said, fearing the consequences if the full truth was ever discovered. I think you underestimate her. You didn't wrong her, did you? If she discovered you'd once fallen foul of the gambling table, would it change her opinion of you in the here and now? I don't think so. As for Caroline, well, perhaps she might not be so generous, and perhaps that would work to your advantage. She might give up on her intentions, Isabel said. Ernest had not thought about it like that, but he also felt certain the Viscount would not approve if he discovered the truth about Ernest's past. The whole matter had been kept a secret, the debts paid off, and Eleanor and her father satisfied. But Ernest's guilt remained. He felt a terrible sense of debt to his father, even as the Duke had assured him repeatedly he had nothing to answer for. You're my son, Ernest. We all make mistakes. What matters is we learn from them. I won't hold this against you, and neither should you hold it against yourself. The Duke had said. But Ernest had not extended that same generosity to himself. The school for blind children had been his salvation. It had given him something else to focus on, other than his own self-pity, and ensured he did something to salve his conscience, even as the beast of guilt still so often reared its ugly head. The truth was, Ernest had not forgiven himself, and in his darker moments he could still believe in the possibility of returning to his previous vices. Would Caroline really give up her desires, or would she simply use the facts against me? What other woman would marry a man with such a chequered past? Ernest asked. He feared the discovery of what he had done, and whilst it was easy to put on an act, his insecurities remained deep-rooted. I think you underestimate what other women are like. Alicia, for example, Isabel said, raising her eyebrows and fixing Ernest with a pointed gaze. He sighed and shook his head, not knowing what to think, even as the fact of his guilt remained. 
she's a delightful woman, but I fear... Well, there was all of that business with her friend, your friend, Lily, those scandal sheets. Imagine if she wrote something about me. What if she discovers it? Oh, why didn't I just get on with things myself? I didn't need the help, but it's no use, is it? He said, shaking his head. His sister took his hand in hers once again and squeezed it. She smiled at him reassuringly, shaking her head and sighing. Only you can forgive yourself, Ernest. No one else can, she said, and now she rose to her feet, telling him she was going to check on their parents before leaving Ernest alone with his thoughts. He too sighed, sitting back in his chair and wondering if the sense of guilt would ever leave him. He had tried to forgive himself, and he knew it was entirely irrational to think this way. But try as he might, the events of the past haunted him, and made him fear for the future too. He liked Alicia, and it seemed she liked him too, but if she discovered the truth about Ernest's past, I don't think she'd be so trusting, a man with a gambling habit entrusted with the kindly donations of others. There'd be a scandal, he thought to himself, imagining the faces of the guests at the garden party if they knew the truth. Ernest had a pile of correspondence waiting for him on his desk, but his heart was not in it that day, and he lay down on the chaise lounge by the window, staring out across the gardens, his thoughts lingering on Alicia and the unfortunate situation he now found himself in. Alicia? Caroline Mim- They'd both think badly of me. And if Caroline discovered the truth, the school would be closed before it was even opened, he lamented, for Ernest could not bring himself to believe his sister's words, or find solace in the thought of his acts of atonement. The past haunted him, and it was with sorrowful lament he went about the remainder of his day, fearing for the future, whilst remaining guilt-ridden for the past. In the evening, he found his father sitting alone in the drawing room drinking brandy. The Duke would sometimes play the pianoforte, a remarkable feat for a man without sight. But tonight he was sitting alone, and Ernest's mother had gone to bed early. Might I sit with you, father? Ernest asked as the Duke looked up on his entering the room. I knew it was you, Ernest. I could tell your footfall in the corridor before you entered the room. I know yours, your mother's, your sister's. I know that of several of the servants too, he said and Ernest smiled. Your senses are quite remarkable, father. You're like a trail hound on the scent, ears pricked, nose attuned, Ernest said, and his father laughed. Yes, that's one way of putting it, I suppose. The garden party was a considerable success, don't you think? The Duke asked. It was, father, yes. I was very pleased with the amount we raised, and the promises of help too, Ernest replied. He had been pleased, but it was his own thoughts now unsettling him, and whilst the subject of his past was taboo, Ernest wanted to share his fears with his father. You've done well, Ernest, the Duke said. Ernest was glad his father could not see the worried expression on his face. Father, do you ever think about me? I mean, about the past, he asked. The expression on his father's face did not change. It rarely did. The Duke rarely gave anything away by his expression. I do, Ernest, but it doesn't change my opinion of you in this moment now. Take Maximilian Oakley. Should his past define him? We all know what kind of man he was turning out to be. Not unlike yourself, I don't think. But he turned his life around. He became a far better person for it. I'm sure there are those who still judge him. But let them do so. Those of us with a more merciful head on our shoulders can see past what has been and see the person he's become, the Duke replied. Perhaps if his father had been angry with him in the past... Ernest might have felt a stronger sense of forgiveness. But as it stood, he had never felt himself truly punished for the mistakes he had made. And in his own mind, he was punishing himself now. Then, I shouldn't hold it against myself. But what of others? W what of the fairer sex? Ernest asked. He was thinking about Alicia and the horror she would surely feel if she discovered the truth about his past. As for Caroline. 
It shouldn't concern you, Ernest. Didn't your mother see past my faults? The Duke said. It's hardly a fault, father, Ernest replied, but his father shook his head. Perhaps not. But my point is, there's always going to be something you might think a woman would find off-putting. But it's not always the case, I assure you. We fall in love with the person before us, not a version of themselves in the future or a former outline. What you were, what you'll be, they don't matter as much as who you are, Ernest. The Duke replied, and it was with these thoughts Ernest went to bed that night, mulling over what had been, and reminding himself he was more than his past, even... Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.